greeting everybody yeah. hi i'll i'll just introduce one second ma'am uh, uh good evening everyone and today we are going to talk on prenatal markers and malformation and for this uh, presentation we have dr geeta dr geeta is a very senior consultant in obstetrics and gynecology at fernandes hospital and she is an expert in fetal medicine so we are going to hear a lot of uh, uh, things uh, on the fetus side from uh, dr geeta over to you doctor ma'am thanks renivas thanks for that brief introduction and this opportunity in these covid times so greetings from the fetus to the neonate so what are we going to learn today one second why am i not able to yeah so the objectives of my talk today would be to deal with the common markers am i audible renivas yes good ma'am audible right the main objectives of my talk would be to deal with the common markers malformations and few syndromes how do we counsel parents when we find markers and malformation what is the role of additional tests in fetal abnormalities like what is nipt kt microarray exome sequencing and we have which dr gayatri i know would be dealing with in more detail what are the limitations of scan what is the role of mri and what are evolving abnormalities so if you define the word congenital malformation it's any structural or fu functional abnormalities that actually occurs during intrauterine life and it should be able to be identified prenatally it may be identified or at birth or later in life but these are major causes of newborn deaths that's why we need to know about them they may result in long term disability with a significant impact on not only the individual mm -hmm. their families societies and the healthcare systems the who quotes the incidence of these birth defects as 7.7% what are the etiologies we know the etiology is almost 50% we don't know what the etiology is but the others would be chromosomal genetic abnormalities teratogenic environmental some betweenings so how do we diagnose these thanks to ultrasound technology and to the ability to detect microscopic and submicroscopic chromosomal aberrations single gene we are able to pick up lots and lots of abnormalities and this diagnosis then provides information for decisions during pregnancy either termination or delivery in a tertiary care center it allows us to have an appropriate treatment plan either parentally either prenatally or to be able to improve the perinatal and long term outcome after birth what are the detection rates and how what are the factors which influence the detection rate there are lots of abnormalities which we can't pick up and this could be based on the operator their skills their experience their training the facilities that they have what is the fetus what is the type of a malformation gestational age at which you had done the ultrasound what is the length and accuracy of follow up that you have done what is the equipment you have to do with and patient factors like obesity if somebody asks you what is the good gestational age to look for abnormalities there are two windows the first window is between 11 to 13 weeks 6 days where we do a nuchal scan with serum biochemistry that is pap a beta hcg and placental growth factor and the second window provided is between 19 to 24 weeks where we do the tfa we prefer to finish the tfa before 20 weeks thanks to the mtp act and to the prenatal diagnostic act where a termination is not allowed after 20 weeks but yes soon it has been extended to 24 weeks so we would place this window as 19 to 24 weeks so what are the advantages when we do a scan between 11 to 13 weeks 6 days what are the other advantages first and foremost you are able to date the pregnancy accurately so that subsequently when there are growth issues you know that she's been adequately dated in the first trimester then you can screen for aneuploidy markers if there is a multiple pregnancy you can determine chorionicity which first definitely is important so that you can manage these pregnancies appropriately and also be able to exclude structural abnormalities so this is the first window where we have we can pick up most of the structural abnormalities 
So this is the NT scan where the fetus should be between 45 to 84. And you can see the details that you can see, all the three segments of the limb, the fingers, the, <laughs> the intracranial structures, the outline of the structures, the orbits, the prenatal premaxillary triangle, the jaws, the heart with the four chambers, outflow tracts, the lungs on either sides, and you can see the stomach and the bladder bubble, and you can see the cord insertion, the ductus venosus, and the lower limbs. So these are the details which you can see nicely, the stomach, the bladder, the two kidneys on either side. So there are lots and lots of information that you can gather even at this stage between 11 to 13 weeks, six days scans. These are the standard planes recommended by the ISWOG to screen for abnormalities. And each plane is important because we can detect certain abnormalities when we look at that plane. So this is the good zoomed up image where we measure the nuchal translucency. So you can see that's a good mid sagittal view. This is the nasal bone. This is the palate. This is the mandible. And there are a lot of intracranial structures that you can see that this thalamus, midbrain, brainstem, the intracranial translucency, which is the future fourth ventricle, the medulla oblongata, and the occipital bone. So this fluid that is there at the posterior part of the neck is what is the nuchal translucency. And depending on the mom values, we say whether it's in the normal range or is it high. And this is an important marker. But apart from that, you can see that there are a lot of structural abnormalities which you can try to detect at this stage. So what are the structural defects you can detect in the first trimester? There are, there's a group about 30% which is always detectable. And these are the major and most of them are lethal abnormalities. So if you pick them up early, you are able to give an option to the parents for a termination. And these are acrania, encephalocele, holoprosencephaly, exomphalus, gastroschisis, megacystic, mesenchymes, and the body star. There are others which are potentially detectable and there are some which are not detectable. Why is it that you can't detect these abnormalities in the first trimester? It is because most of these are evolving and these evolve over time. And these would be tumors, cardiomyopathies, heart blocks, absent pulmonary valve, valvular stenosis. Some of them evolve over time and the fetus should have been adequately grown to be able to see these uh, organs like anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, the ventricular septal defects, partial AVS, AVSD, coactation of iota. And these are ones which you certainly can't detect. Whatever you do, you will not be able to detect these abnormalities. So if you see this, this is the outline of the fetal skull. You can see the midline, which is important to see that there is a cleavage and there are two equal parts, choroid plexus and the cortex. And if you do not find the vault of the skull, you know that you're dealing with a case of anencephaly. And this can be detected any time after 11 weeks. So these are various examples of acrania, anencephaly, which is a major lethal abnormality. And if you're given the opportunity to detect this as early as this, certainly the couples will opt for termination and be able to do it very easily. Then the other abnormality is a holoprosencephaly. And what is holoprosencephaly? There is a midline cleavage. So you have a single ventricle, you have fused thalami, and this is a good pathological specimen of uh, early holoprosencephaly. And these uh, are generally associated with facial abnormalities like cyclops, proboscis, midline clefts. So this is generally associated with even chromosomal abnormalities like 13 and 18. Again, this is one of the certainly picked up abnormalities in the first trimester. The next, this, when you have holoprosencephaly and polydactyly, you know that there is a possibility of trisomy 13. Then the other abnormalities is kyphoscoliosis or a limb body wall complex, where apart from a huge exomphalus, you have a spinal deformity. So this is a typical case of uh, limb body wall complex, which is again detectable in the first trimester. Coming to omphalocele, 
If you try to pick up omphalocele before 11 weeks, you will be overdiagnosing because there is something called a physiological omphalocele at when the fetus is less than 45 millimeters. There is protrusion of the mid, uh, uh, mid gut outside of the abdominal wall and this forms the physiological omphalocele. So we should not try to diagnose this before 11 weeks because this is very, very physiological as, as the fetus grows, this midgut undergoes rotation and undergoes, uh, it, goes in, it becomes an intra-abdominal structure. So this abnormality, but if it's more than seven millimeters or if there is liver as contents, you know that you're dealing with a pathological omphalocele and not a physiological omphalocele. Exomphalus with contents as liver and bowel can be picked up because again, the abdominal wall should be well formed by about 11 to 12 weeks when the fetus is more than 45 millimeters. So here you see a major abnormality again, which is, has a big worse prognosis and may be associated with trisomy 18. So this again, when you find uh, an omphalocele, you should be able to do a karyotyping and try to detect trisomy 18. Gastroschisis compared to omphalocele does not have a physiology, I mean, a covering over it, and it is a para umbilical defect, whereas a uh, omphalocele is a midline defect through the umbilical wall. This is a para umbilical defect where there is no covering. The uh, umbilical cord is inserted to a side, and you find that the bowel is completely lying outside the abdomen. Encephalocele is again a protrusion of, there's a defect in the occipital bone or the frontal bone, and you find that the brain contents are protruding outside, and this could be isolated. And most often it is through the occipital bone, or it may be associated with syndromes like Meckel-Gruber. Here you find that there is a huge encephalocele, occipital encephalocele. You find bilateral polycystic kidneys enlarged with multiple cysts. You find polydactyly of the upper and the lower limbs. And this is a typical case of Meckel-Gruber, which you know has an autosomal recessive inheritance. So every time a woman is pregnant, she has a 25% chance of having this abnormality again. This is again a first trimester pickup and termination of a Meckel-Gruber where you find enlarged kidneys, you have polydactyly of the upper and lower limbs, and you have a huge encephalocy. Now, what is megacystis? Megacystis is when we do said we find the bladder in the first trimester. And if this bladder measures more than seven millimeters, it is called megacystis. This is mild when it's between eight to 12, and it is severe when it is more than 17 millimeters. And why is this important? Because if it is between eight to 16, two thirds of these cases are associated with aneuploidy, and it could be any of the chromosomal abnormalities. One third of them, if there is no aneuploidy, the other one third generally resolve. But when the bladder length is more than 17 millimeters, you are dealing with progressive obstructive uropathy and the prognosis here is not very good because the kidneys are hugely hydronephrotic and there is renal dysplasia and by the time the infant is born may have pulmonary hypoplasia and uh, kidney failure. So this is a typical case of early onset obstructive uh, uropathy with huge hydrourethronephrosis and an enlarged distended bladder. Now, what about missing segments? Like we said, in a 13, 11 to 13 week six day scan, we are expected to see all three segments of the limbs. And here you find that is an isolated, the left forearm and the hand is missing. Apart from that, there is no other abnormality, but missing limbs may be isolated or may be associated. It may involve one limb or it may involve all the limbs. Here is a typical example of a tetrafocomelia. That means all the four limbs are absent. There is bilateral cleft lip and palate. There is hypertellorism, that is widely spaced eyes, and there is ear and nose malformation. And this, when you say, is about Robert's syndrome. When you have missing limbs associated with these, it is a case of Robert's syndrome. 
then the limbs again when they are so short you can pick them up in the first trimester and this is a typical case of achondrogenesis where you not only have small limbs but you have decreased uh, ossification so again this is a very very lethal abnormality cystic hygroma is again associated you have multiple separated cystic spaces all around the fetus and this is associated with turner syndrome that means if you do a karyotype most often the karyotype would be 45 xo and again if there is no cystic hygroma there is other type of turner syndrome where they have low stature exclusively feminine phenotype and they have gonadal dysgenesis these cases cannot be picked up in the antenatal scan because they don't generally do not have a cystic hygroma the other cystic hygroma i mean they don't generally have and that is only after birth that you can pick up these turner syndrome phenotype then what is orofacial digital syndrome when you have polydactyly you have clefts you are able to diagnose orofacial digital these abnormalities are very important because they have an increased recurrence risk they are generally autosomal recessive in inheritance if you diagnose multiple pregnancy we said yes we have to certainly determine the chorionicity and here is a case where you picked up a mono amniotic that means they are in one sac there is no dividing membrane and you find that they have such early cord entanglement and a missed miscarriage and this is a case where we have been able to pick up a trap that is twin reversed arterial perforation and you find that this is a normal fetus this is the pump twin and this is the trap twin you can pick these uh, abnormalities very early and give options to the couple this is again our own case of conjoined twins which was picked up between 11 to 13 weeks six days ectopia cordis what is ectopia cordis here you find that the entire heart liver bowel is lying outside and these five abnormalities are associated with an abnormality called pentology of cantor so these are the major detected abnormalities which we can find and this we know we can identify about 30 to 40% of the all major abnormalities if you have not if a patient has had this abnormality in the previous pregnancy like an anencephaly you are able to give an early reassurance to the risk mothers and say yes this baby does not have that problem in case there are abnormalities like an omphalocele you can exclude trisomy 18 and then give them a favorable prognosis if the abnormality is fairly severe you are able to give them an easier pregnancy termination and again if we follow the standard anatomical views that i mentioned we should be able to pick up more and more abnormalities like i say if you look you may be able to find but what are the limitations of the first trimester about abnormalities we need expertise we know some of the abnormalities develop later and you may not be possible to detect them which we had mentioned and again there is an uncertain cost and benefit ratio most of these abnormalities may end up in a missed miscarriage and you would have unnecessarily uh, done the scan so we are really not sure of the cost versus benefit ratio now coming to the major aneuploidy that is down syndrome are there any uh, markers which you can do uh, which you can look at to detect trisomy 21 because we know trisomy 21 has is the most common cause of neurodevelopmental delay mental retardation they have lot of associated features if you have facial features heart defects like avsd bowel malformation like hirschsprungs you can pick up but what you can't pick up is vision or hearing losses hence there have been various markers and screening tests which have come into vogue to try to screen for aneuploidies like down syndrome so what are the evolving steps if you see in the 60s only age was taken into consideration and any woman who was more than 35 was told that she has a 1 in 250 chance of developing trisomy but as in the 80s we have heard of the triple test which is alpha fetoprotein estriol and uh, 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 beta hcg this is no more relevant in today because the detection rates are very less 
quadruple came in the 90s. Combined screening, that means the first trimester, 11 to 13 weeks, six day scan with a double marker, came in 2005. And now from the 2011, almost eight years now, so we have the cell-free DNA, fetal fraction of DNA. And this, you see that as the tests have improved, so has the detection rate. So if you see, only if you take age as a criteria, your detection rate of Downs will be only 35. But with cell-free DNA today, we have almost 99% detection of Down syndrome. So we will see how these tests can be used to screen for Down syndrome in the first trimester. So what are markers? Why do we say we are, uh, they are markers and not malformation? Because they do not ask such, they are not structural abnormalities. They do not cause any functional abnormality, but they are indicators of an increased risk for aneuploidy. So we look for markers because it is associated with increased risk of aneuploidy. And as the number of markers increase, so does the risk for certain aneuploidies increase. And they have an effect on the a priori risk. So the a priori risk for a Downs is like at age of 35, I say the risk is about 1 in 250. So if I have an increased NT of 2.5 at a woman who is already advanced maternal age, this increases the probability rather than having the same NT of 2.5 in an 18-year-old girl. So the effect on an a priori risk is relatively small when only an isolated soft marker is detected. Remember, most soft markers resolve by the third trimester. Hence, a postnatal genetic evaluation is not necessary unless there are signs of aneuploidy on clinical examination. So this is the first and most important marker, that is the NT. So what is nuchal translucency? It is a sonographic appearance of a collection of fluid under the skin behind the fetal neck in the first trimester. So when I say NT, it is only in the first trimester. That means after 14 weeks, we do not use the term nuchal translucency. So this is the fluid collection behind the occipital bone and the skin, which is measured. And here you find it is about 4.74 millimeters. So this is the forehead, this is the nasal bone, and this is the palate. So this is only a sonographic appearance of a collection of fluid. So when do you say it is increased? And when the in NT is increased, so is the risk for aneuploidy like trisomy 21 increased. So the gestational age, like we mentioned, should be between 11 to 13 weeks, six days. You should have the fetus zoomed so that you can accurately measure the NT. You should be only able to see the head and the thorax and not the entire. And the fetus you must see should be in the neutral mid-sagittal and the neck should not be too flexed and too extended. Then you measure the NT and give the woman a risk of trisomy 21. So what are the para, uh, parameters you say? You take the nuchal scan between 11 to 13 weeks, six days, and combine it with biochemical markers like PAPE and beta-HCG, and age, ethnicity, whether she has diabetes, whether it's an IVF. So you look at other markers like ductus venosus, nasal bone, and tricuspid regurgitation, and give the mother a risk using ultrasound, biochemistry, and maternal age. So this combination of maternal age, NT, serum beta HCG, PAPE, has a good detection rate of almost 90% with a false positive rate of about 3%. So how do we give the report to a mother when we do the NT? We take into consideration the CRM, the NT, the BPD, and heart rate, and then give them a risk. In this 28-year-old woman, her background risk is about 1 in 672. Based on the NT of 2, her adjusted risk, that means because the NT is in the normal range, her risk has come down to 1 in 13,436. That means almost 20 times her risk has reduced. The risk of trisomy 18 and 13 also has become so less because there are no major structural abnormalities, the risk for trisomy 18 and 13 also has reduced so, so much. That means that risk for trisomy 13 is less 
or than 20,000 because you have no holoprosen carefully, you have no exomphilus. So both these risks have come down. There's no megacystis. So naturally, this risk has come down. So when the mother is low risk, what do we advise her? She needs to come only follow-up scan for a TIFA. That means between 19 to 24 weeks. But supposing the risk is more, again, you have this mother where her background risk is 1 in 225, but because the NT is high, you have a risk of 1 in 17. That means she has a high risk. And why is this risk high? You see that the beta HCG is 6.26 moms, and this has increased her risk for trisomy 21. So how do we advise these? We counsel these mothers and advise them to do a karyotyping and also follow up for growth of the baby later on, right? So when the NT is more than 3.5, for any mother of any age, it is certainly the 95th centile. When the PAPE is less than 0.5, Again, it's a marker for Downs. You need to follow up if the karyotype is normal for fetal growth restriction. Beta HCG we saw in the last example was above six. So again, she comes in the high risk. So any of these are there, then these values justify an invasive testing. That means an NT above 3.5, a low PAPE less than 0.5, and a beta HCG more than 2.5 mops. So the algorithm that we use is maternal age, NT, nasal bone, ductus venosus, tricuspid, beta HCG, PAPE. If it's normal, she just comes for a detailed scan later. But if it's high, if she's at high risk, then she has a detailed structural evaluation, uh, invasive testing to pick up abnormal karyotype. So what is the role today of cell-free DNA? Can we advise cell-free DNA instead of doing chorion villus sampling? What is the role of uh, cell-free DNA today? This cell-free DNA originates from the trophoblast and can be detected as early as five weeks. This forms five to 10% of the total cell-free DNA in the mother. And the biggest advantage is it is cleared immediately after birth, unlike fetal cells in the maternal circulation, which may persist in the next pregnancy. The detection rates, depending on the aneuploidies, are so. You can detect five common abnormalities, that is trisomy 21, 18, 13, Turner's, other sex chromosomal abnormalities. 99.7 is the detection rate that is claimed by the companies doing the uh, cell-free DNA. But remember, this is only a screening test and not a diagnostic test. It completely does not rule out all aneuploidies. It only looks for those five chromosomes, whereas we know that increased NT may be associated with many other chromosomal abnormalities. It does not detect single gene conditions, and it certainly does not detect any congenital abnormalities. So when you have an increased NT, or you're suspecting thalassemia because the patient has a family history, or there is a gross congenital abnormality, Cell-free DNA is not in, uh, of any use. So what is the role today of a cell-free DNA? When can we advise a patient to have a cell-free DNA? Here is an example where a woman is 39 years old, husband is 49, she has a child who's 18 years. This is a spontaneous conception. Her NT is in a good range, 2.6. There is a good nasal bone. Everything else looks fine but still, st she still wants a reassurance that she's not dealing with Downs, then you can ask for a cell-free DNA. There are no obvious abnormalities. NT is in the normal range. Because of high maternal uh, age, you want to do. And this is how you look at the report. The fetal fraction should be above 5%. Only then is the report reliable. Here you find that the fetal fraction is about 9.7%. And the risk comes like one in 10,000, less than one in 10,000. So it is not a diagnostic test. It is only a screening test. So how can you incorporate cell-free DNA into screening when you have markers and you have an intermediate risk? This is where you need not offer invasive tests. You can offer them NIPT in the intermediate risk group. 
and offer invasive for the high risk. So you have initial screening, you have low risk, you can only have a TFA scan, you have an intermediate risk between one in 100 to one in 1000, you can offer them an IPT or high risk, that means less than one in 100, you can offer invasive testing. So what are the advances in diagnosis? You can do a karyotype, microarray or exome sequences. So what is the role of chromosomal microarray today in fetuses with increased NT? We are no more doing only a karyotype because we know that increased NT is associated with many, many fetal genetic disorders, syndromes. So today what is done is microarray and not only karyotype, but the, the biggest disadvantage is you get a lot of variants of uncertain significance where you do not know how to counsel these couples. So what are the indications for microarray today? Any major minor congenital defect, increased NT, early fetal growth restriction, previous submicroscopic abnormality or previous stillbirth. But the drawback is there is uh, occurrence of variants of uncertain significance and incidental findings. So what is the outcome when the NT is increased? How do we counsel these couples? If the NT is normal, that means less than 95th centile, and there are no major abnormalities, you have alive and well about 97%. But if you have an NT more than 6.5, there is associated fetal death in about 20%. There is chromosomal defect in about 65%. Major fetal abnormalities, especially of the heart, may be seen in about 45%. So the alive and well, that means if there are no congenital heart abnormalities, if there's no IUD, there are no chromosomal defects, the take-home baby rate is about 15%. So as the NT increases, so does the take-home baby rate reduce. So this is a study where they have studied 561 fetuses with increased NT and normal karyotype. Again, they found that they could have spontaneous miscarriage. They may undergo termination because of high drops. There may be structural or genetic abnormalities, adverse perinatal outcomes, but again, live births with no defects is, even if the NT is high, there's about 81% take home baby. What are the genetic syndromes which are associated with increased NT? There's a whole list and I'm not going to go through these difficult. What is important is NT is associated with major cardiac defects. So if the karyotype or the microarray has come normal, these fetuses certainly need a fetal anomaly scan, a detailed good scan with a detailed echo to exclude cardiac abnormalities because when the NT is more, 40% of these may be associated with congenital heart disease and the type of congenital heart disease may be anything between uh, phallostetrology to transposition, there is no typical abnormality which is associated with increased NT. One syndrome which we must remember when the NT is increased is the Noonan syndrome. In Noonan syndrome, they have a very large NT. The ductus venosus sometimes may not be identified. The uh, nuchal edema persists. As the pregnancy progresses, the fetuses may have cardiomyopathy, Abnormalities of the heart like AVSD and pulmonary stenosis are typical of Noonan syndrome. So if you see in the first trimester, they only manifest as increased NT. But as the pregnancy progresses, then you'll have cystic hygroma, brachycephaly, renal abnormalities, hepatomegaly, dysmorphic facies on a 3D, cardiac conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and pulmonary stenosis. So this is an evolving abnormality, a Noonan syndrome. So in increased NT, especially if it persists, the fetus needs to be uh, watched for development of Noonans. So having finished the first trimester, we will now move on to the second trimester. So anytime after 15, 16 weeks is when our second trimester starts. And this is where if she has missed the first trimester screening with NT and biochemical, we offer her quadruple screening. It is certainly a must to have a scan before test because you may have obvious abnormalities or multiple pregnancies, which you, if you miss, the results are not going to be reliable. 
The gestational age should be between 15 to 19. The VPD, that's the biparietal diameter, should be between 31 to 52. It is again a screening and not a diagnostic test. It screens for aneuploidies like Downs and alpha fetoprotein if it's increased, which will again a marker for neural tube defects. So how does the report look? What are the parameters? Again, you need to take the weight of the baby, mother, the day, uh, age of the mother, whether she's had a previous Downs, is she on HCG injections? So these are the parameters, again, the BPD. So these are the four, quadruple is four markers, alpha fetoproteins, HCG, unconjugated estriol, and inhibit A. Again, you may get a high risk for Downs or a high risk for Aneuploidy. Like we said earlier, as with NIPT and quadruple, if you compare the quad test to NIPT and first trimester, it is only 80% detection rates, whereas we have better tests today like uh, first trimester screening and NIPT. Now coming to the second trimester diagnosis of fetal abnormalities. If you ask me today, what is the good gestational age? If I only have one scan, which is the gestational age where you would offer the mother? I would say any time between 18 to 19 weeks is a good stage to diagnose congenital abnormalities. Most of them are obvious. So the diagnosis of fetal abnormalities is the primary goal of doing a good obstetric ultrasound. So the gestational age, like we mentioned, is 19 to 21 weeks. Uh, the, certainly, the accuracy shows great variabilities among centers and operators. What are the markers in the second trimester, and how do we counsel a couple when we pick up an abnormality? Like we said, markers are not malformations. They are just anatomical variants with no functional importance. They are often temporary, but they have a variable association with aneuploidy. So you can complicate and really worry a mother by giving these markers. So this is a choroid plexus cyst. Within the choroid plexus, you have a cyst, which is called the choroid plexus cyst. So if you have a choroid plexus cyst, the first thing is to look for abnormalities. If you find a nice open hand, that means there is no trisomy 18. And this assumes this is of no significance if you find no structural abnormality in the fetus, the hand is open, you have excluded trisomy 18 because choroid plexus cysts were associated with trisomy 18 and trisomy 18 is a, there is associated structural abnormality. So we do not give significance to choroid plexus cysts if we find a, no structural abnormality and especially an open hand. So these are all the soft markers. First, this is a golf ball or an echogenic intracardiac echogenic focus. You find this is the cross section of the thorax. This is the fourth chamber view. This is the left atrium, left ventricle. You find a small, bright echogenic spot, which is called an intracardiac echogenic focus. This is absolutely of no significance. There are no associated cardiac abnormalities. So, if a woman has had a good first trimester screening, and I find this on a second trimester screening, I ignore it. Again, choroid plexus cyst, we mentioned. It's of no associated importance if I find no structure. So we will try to see some of the markers and see how we counsel these women. So this is mild pilectasis. This is ARSA, which is an important marker today. This is abrin, uh, right subclavian artery. You have hypoplastic or absent nasal bone, echogenic bowel, increased nuchal fold, or a short femur. These are the markers today which have a good importance. Echogenic focus, CP cyst, phylectasis, ARSA, anosified nasal bone, echogenic bowel, increased nuchal uh, fold thickness. It is no more nuchal translucency. The terminology used is nuchal fold thickness and a short femur. So if a woman has had a screening, either with quadruple screening or the first trimester screening, and I find choroid plexus cyst, intracardiac echogenic focus, or a single umbilical artery, there is no need to do anything else. We 
just do a good targeted scan and leave her alone. And certainly these fetuses also do not need any neonatal follow up. This is the recommendation. That means women with a low chance through testing in either first or second trimester or either the declined screening then should not be referred for further assessment in the presence of CP cyst, echogenic focus, or a two vesicle. But which are the markers which are important today then? The important markers to look for is ventricular megaly. That means the ventricles are more than 10 millimeters, mucal fold thickness more than six millimeters, and ARSA. When we find these three markers, ventricular megaly, increased mucal fold thickness, or aberrant right subclavian artery, these increase the risk for of trisomy by three to four fold. Hypoplastic nasal bone increases the risk six to seven fold. So this today are the important markers and these should be offered definitely a carrier type. So the soft markers which need to be followed up are mucal fold equal to or greater than six, ventricular megaly, atrium equal to or greater than 10, echogenic bowel where the density is equivalent to bone, renal pelvic dilatation or the fetus is growth restricted very early in pregnancy like 20 weeks these should be reported and the woman referred for further assessment and treated as for any other suspected enough the biggest bigger masquerader is echogenic small power this could be transient and idiopathic finding in only 0.5% because of intrigue bleed and the fetus has swallowed this blood, there could be just echogenic small bubble. It is associated with cystic fibrosis. It may be associated with fetal aneuploidy like 21, 13, 18. It may be associated with congenital infections like CMV and toxoplasmosis. On follow-up, there could be primary gastrointestinal pathology or there could be a marker for fetal growth restriction. So this particular marker, we really do not know and we find it at a loss to explain and counsel these couples when we find this marker. You don't know whether we offer them karyotype, we have to offer them cystic fibrosis screening, TOT screening, and still follow up for growth restriction and any gastrointestinal pathology. And the incidence of aneuploidy is 3.3 to 16% with trisomy 21 being the commonest. Now, this is a case where you find an echogenic small bowel in 19 weeks. At 27 weeks, you find that there are multiple small bowel loops which are dilated. By 30 weeks, you find so many bowel loops dilated. And what is the outcome? By 34 weeks, you find there are multiple small bowel loops which are dilated. So patient had a delivery at 34 weeks, a male baby 2.5. There is, you find multiple dilated bowel loops, and this baby had jejunal atresia, had a laparotomy, and jejunal jejunal anastomosis was done. So, if you see the odds ratio by sonographic markers, increased mucal fold thickness has the highest 20.7. If there's a major abnormality, short hema. So, these are some of the odds ratio. Now, coming to second trimester malformations, we finished with the markers. Again, these are the 20 standard planes we need to use, and each plane is important to detect certain abnormalities. And we know these abnormalities may not be just syndromic, or it may be because of any of these. It could be genetic or environmental. So whenever you find an abnormality on ultrasound, I'm sure the parents come back to the neonatologist or the fetal medicine specialist. And the questions that they need to ask is, is this abnormality compatible with life? And in Kefli, my answer is simple, no. We look at any associated abnormality. So we said, is it isolated? Is it associated? Associated with syndromes or other abnormalities? Do we need any genetic evaluation? Does this fetus need any antenatal follow-up, like a diaphragmatic hernia? We need to follow up to see what is the lung growth rate. Are there any antenatal interventions or treatment available today? We have a lot of procedures like exit and uh, ECMOs and all which are neonatal, but there are a lot of intrauterine surgeries also being done today. 
where and when to terminate if the abnormality is very serious and has no uh, as a bad prognosis what is the mode of termination if there is no termination what is the postnatal evaluation so these are the points which we must remember when we are counseling parents and we always have to be realistic and non directive we do not force our decisions either to terminate or continue but place the facts before them and give them the right out, uh, outcomes that you you know in your experience and all these counseling issues are important depending on the gestation age so remember we should have a precise diagnosis so all attempts must be made to arrive at a precise diagnosis we must evaluate the gestational history find out if she's had any fever she has any pets uh, to see for torch infections look at family history for genetic factors look at the patient anatomy for clues to embryological etiopathological markers and invasive testing depending on the type so the invasive testings that you can do today we have already discussed are the karyotype fish microarray now these are the commonest the commonest abnormalities that you can pick up are the neural tube defects these neural tube defects fall into two main groups one is the defect which involves the brain structures anencephaly and encephalocele the other group is the defects which involve the spinal cord meningocele myelomeningocele and other forms of spina bifida what is important today is the diagnosis of open spina bifida has also evolved over the years in the 80s the epileptics were often asked to do quadruple test and then if the alpha fetal protein was raised they were asked to go for a scan but again this is of no major significance now or relevance today because you have indirect markers direct evaluation of the spine and today as early as 11 to 13 weeks intracranial translucency which is the made uh, future fourth ventricle is an important marker to see if this patient has neural tube defect so the detection rate by ultrasound at 11 to 14 weeks today is about 14 to 15% so open spina bifida scan at 17 to 20 weeks there are two important markers that is the if you look at the brain and look at lemon and banana sign there is almost a 99% detection rate so you may or may not be able to see the spine sometimes depending on the fetal position but if you've seen a flattened cerebellum which is called the banana sign you have the scalloping of the frontal bones which is the lemon sign and you have ventricular megaly you certainly need to look for open spina bifida the outcomes are very bad in these conditions because of high neonatal morbid morbidity mortality they often have hydrocephalus which needs ventricular peritoneal shunt the lower limbs may be having talipus or they may be unable to move them neurogenic bladders and infections due to surgeries are other major morbidities in these how do we prevent neural tube defects it is our duty to advise folate rich foods and oral supplements of folic acid and b12 for at least 3 months before conception or at least until 12 weeks of gestation this is another case now we look at abnormalities she's a third gravida first was a neonatal death second she has a she came to us from saudi at around 32 weeks and what do we find this is a transverse section of the fetal head and you find that there is a big cleft there is vermian hypoplasia the cisterna magna is seen to be communicating with the fourth ventricle the corpus callosum was intact this is a mid sagittal view you find that the vermis is quite small so obviously patient had these questions why did this happen now what will happen now i'm already 32 weeks what is the future of my baby will you be able to treat this condition will it happen again if so should we have been able to predict or prevent why was i not told before let's try to see how we handle this case so we did an mri at 32 weeks and the diagnosis came as schubert syndrome that is you can you see this molar tooth sign which is very very the enlarged cerebellar peduncles cerebral peduncles and you find that this is the cerebellum you find the cisterna magna communicating with the fourth ventricle 
the vermis was ascertained for biometry, the cranial cord, everything was okay. There was non-visualization of the vermis. There is molar tooth sign. This is very, very, very typical of Joubert and the normal supratentorial compartment. So we were able to give some answers to this mother even before the birth of this baby as to what the condition is. So the MRI in certain condition helps in lesion characterization, helps in decision making and may also affect treatment planning. Certainly in this case, it improved our diagnosis. So she had a cesarean section in view of previous sections, a 38 weeks female, the weight was 3.1, everything was fine. There was subtle dysmorphism and no other. But what was typical was this, there was a irregular breathing pattern with intermittent tachypnea and apnea and abnormal eye movements. A neurosonogram confirmed the same findings. And this mother was then, it, we, again an MRI was done, you find the molar tooth sign again. The fourth ventricle was shaped like a bat wing. So what is Joubert syndrome? It's an autosomal recessive disorder, variable combination of CNS, respiratory and eye abnormalities, and there is a variable phenotype. There could be partial or complete absence of cerebellar vermis is certainly a finding, but the other cardinal findings could be episodic tachypnea, jerky movements, hypotonia. The outcomes could be three. The children who would die very young, Babies who survive but are severely developmentally delayed and have a variety of visual and motor handicaps. This baby, fortunately, is today four years, has and falls into this category where the developmental portions follow within the mildly deranged range. IQ could be between 70 to 80. So this Joubert syndrome diagnosis is based on physical symptoms and molar tooth sign. Molecular genetic testing is a available. So what happened to this woman? Next pregnancy, she came to us. We did the clinical exam in the affected baby, offered her a prenatal diagnosis, CVS at about 12 weeks, and this baby report came as a heterozygous for this. So she could safely continue the pregnancy. So once we have a diagnosis, the message is try to complete the diagnosis. See if you can complete the diagnosis and then offer them prenatal genetic testing in their subsequent pregnancy. This is another case where it's a 21 weeks, she came to us with very high blood pressures, scan the fetus was small, and the placenta showed these cystic spaces. So a diagnosis, and there were multiple abnormalities, like an enlarged cisterna magna, cerebellar hypoplasia, Exomphalus with liver and bowelous contents. You can see there is post axial polydactyly, echogenic small bowel, heart was normal. So there is placenta cystic spaces and this. And the first suspicion was whether we are dealing with partial bone. So we did a karyotype, amniocentesis was done, karyotype came normal. In view of severe PE, she had a termination and how do we go about? Do we offer her autopsy? Will it give additional uh, information? So we offered her an autopsy. This is the external evaluation, post axial polydactyly, omphalous seal, polydactyly, helical pits, huge exomphalus, heterogeneous placenta with cystic spaces, which gave a diagnosis of placental mesenchymal dysplasia in partial mole, the the, uh, the karyotype would be of a triploidy. They have 69. Because this was a normal karyotype, the diagnosis of partial mole was excluded. What was important was an internal examination where the baby was actually small and clinical. All the organs, especially the liver, pancreas, were on the larger side. So there was adrenal cytomegaly, islet cell hyperplasia, and then the diagnosis was concluded as Beck uh, with Wheatman syndrome with placental mesenchymal dysplasia. So the anomaly when you detect a structural abnormality, it doesn't end with karyotype. You need to complete the diagnosis in cases where the parents have opted for termination, even an autopsy sometimes helps to add to this information. So the additional value of fetal autopsy is what I wanted to show in this case. So a pathological examination of the fetus after termination can provide essential information, 
a definitive diagnosis and its recurrence risk for future pregnancies. Now coming to hydrops vitalis, again, this is a condition where the etiology could be maternal, fetal or placental. Often, despite all the investigations, we may or may not be able to come to a cause for this hydrops. So this is a 27 weeker RH positive with polyhydramnus hydrops. Why do we say hydrops? Because there is fluid in more than two cavities. There is pleural effusion, there is pericardial effusion, there is cardiomegaly, there is polyhydramnus, and there is tricuspid regurgitation. When we examined the placenta in this hydropic infant, we found a large mass, a heterogeneous suscus, circumscribed mixed hypoecocaria with very increased vascularity. And this is a typical case of corangioma of the placenta. The middle cerebral artery peak systolic uh, velocity indicated fetal anemia. So baby is RH, mother is RH positive. So this is non-immune hydrops, probably secondary to the corangioma. So how do we deal with it? The risks are many. If you don't deal with it, the baby can die. So what, did they, what are the intrauterine management options that are available? Because of anemia, you can do serial transfusions. You can do a fetoscopic laser coagulation of the fetal feeder vessel. Chemosclerosis with absolute alcohol, endoscopic surgical devascularization, and therapeutic amnioreduction for the polyadramnus in small corangiomas conservative. So this baby had anemia, had hydrops, had a huge big corangioma. So she had amnioreduction, she had intrauterine blood transfusion, and she also had fetoscopic laser coagulation of the fetal vessels. Liker can give us a lot of information. So we not only look at the fetus, we also need to see the environment around the fetus, that's the placenta and the lyca, and the oligohydramis, the congenital malformations of the kidney are very important. It could be either an obstructive uropathy with the keyhole bladder, bilateral gross hydronephrosis, enlarged echogenic kidneys like an infantile polycystic kidneys or bilateral renal agenesis. All these renal malformations lead to severe oligohydramnus and anhydramnus. The, so the types of renal abnormalities could be cystic kidneys, bilateral renal agenesis or obstructive uropathies. Whenever you have an obstructive uropathies or any of the renal causes, always remember to again rule out associated abnormalities like Vactoral. So what is Vactoral or Vater syndrome? You will have vertebral abnormalities, anal atresia, cardiac defects, tracheoesophageal fistulas, renal abnormalities, and limb abnormalities. What is important? It's a sporadic disorder. So all these abnormalities we have tried to see, but what is the detection rate of fetal abnormalities when you do a second trimester ultrasound screening? What do the study says? The prenatal detection rate ranges anywhere between 17 to 85 percent and this depends on the type of abnormality and the system involved. So what is the detection rate versus abnormality? And then carefully I must say by 12 weeks it should be actually 100 percent. Open spina bifida 90 percent. Where do we fall down? It is in cardiac only 50 percent. Right? So depending on the type of abnormality, depending on the experience, depending on the time you've spent, you can have better detection rates. So if you see 61 obstetric ultrasound units from protein European countries, they have found the accuracy in unselected populations. They found 56% only were detected and 55% of the major ident were identified be before 24. Now coming to the third trimester, we finish with the first and second trimester coming to the third trimester. The expectations and excitement for a couple increases by the time they reach the third trimester. But we find this is the most challenging and exciting time because most of the maternal complications develop like PIH, diabetes, which may affect the growth of the fetus. Suddenly, when we do a growth scan, we may pick up normal, which will have developed. 
Why do we, they develop later? We know that development is a dynamic and as the fetal growth happens, anomalies may manifest. As the size of the organs increase, you have better structural delineation. Certainly function increases, so you will have the pressure effect seen very well. There may be some intrauterine infections which may affect and cause problems like a cataract. The common conditions which are picked up in the third trimester are achondroplasia, microcephaly, and intestinal obstructions. We cannot offer termination at this, so what we have to do is when we identify, we counsel the couples, we choose the time and mode of delivery, and provide the neonatal assistance. So this is a typical third trimester diagnosis where after 24 weeks, you find short femurs find a rhizomelic shortening of the extremities, you have frontal bossing, you have the diaphysis angulation and a trident hand. You have this forehead bossing, you have a trident hand where all these four fingers look almost of the same size. You have a shortening, this is nothing but a case of achondroplasia. Today they have diagnosed this after 24 weeks. This is another sign which is described. There is a widening of the femoral proximal diaphysis metaphysis angle. And this is today certainly supposed to be a good marker for achondroplasia. You find this is the normal femur. The metaphysis diaphysis angle normally is this, but you find that this angle is increased and this is called a femoral angle. And this is the most consistent sonographic feature when there is shortened long bones. And if there's frontal bossing, you can certainly tell them that you're dealing with uh, achondroplasia. Certainly confirmation is by the mutation is the FGFR3 gene. Now third trimester syndromic association. Another example, this lady, the only finding we had in the second trimester was we picked up this polydactyly of the hand and feet. Second trimester, when she came at 30 weeks almost, the second we picked up only hydronephrosis. So we were wondering how is this polydactyly dealing with hydronephrosis. By 35 weeks when we called, we found a large cystic mass of five into three centimeters behind the bladder in front of the sacrum. And there were low level centimeters. But what gave us a clue was a fimbrial end of a tube. You can see this. Can you see this? This looked like a adjacent structure, and this was typically like we felt this was a uterus, hydrometrocolpus, and this was the fallopian tube. This gave us a clue, and we thought we looked at the gender, it was a female gender. So, certainly, a diagnosis of hydrometrocolpus with obstruction of the ureters leading to secondary hydronephrosis was made. And the postnatal outcome, you can see the same extra finger female gender, polydactyly, and this gave us a diagnosis of Kaufman syndrome, again, which is autosomal recessive. But we cannot differentiate Kaufman syndrome from bardet beetle syndrome till we follow up these babies to, if they develop obesity and retinal dystrophy, it goes more in favor of bardet beetle syndrome. Another commonest abnormality that we pick up in the third trimester is Ovariances, generally they are small, less than six centimeters. They will be asymptomatic. They develop because their hormones are sensitive. Majority are benign and resolve spontaneously by eight weeks. So we do not offer them any other uh, management issues. Only follow up for about 18 weeks when you find these ovariances. The other CNS abnormalities which we have found in the third trimester was this case of a huge AV malformation of the middle cerebral artery. You find 35 weeks, we scan, everything was normal till then. You find a huge foreign Catholic cyst and you find a vascular AV malformation. There was a shift of the midline structures to the opposite side. And this on a power angio, you found that there is a huge AV malformation this was the uh, MRI after birth. So on MRI after birth, we found large intracranial AV malformation in the right front of the right region and porencephalic. So how was the neonatal course? 
this is a normal vaginal delivery. This is the MRI after birth. The CNS examination, everything was fine. The baby remained active. The MRI brain was done, which revealed a right pile AV fistula and left foreign kephali cyst. Ultrasound abdomen and infotogram were always normal. The baby was discharged. The baby is growing well as per now. We'll have to see for this follow. But the complications which this baby can develop is intellectual disabilities, spastic hemiparesis, seizures, intracranial hemorrhage, optic atrophy, growth hemorrhage, and we can offer them symptomatic treatment, embolization, and surgery for AV fistulas. The other abnormality we pick up generally in the third trimester is a vein of gallon in, uh, aneurysm, again, which is an arteriovenous shunt between the vein of gallon and the cerebral arteries. They can develop ventricular megaly, heart failures, cardiomegaly, and ascites. So to conclude, we have seen a lot of benefits of ultrasound scan, especially if normal, we can reassure the couple. The parental reassurance is of the most important. It's a very gratifying and satisfying feeling. If there is an abnormality, we can give options for further testing, referral, counseling regarding planned birth or termination, preparation for the special needs of the child. We may need to alter the obstetric management and the time of delivery. We will certainly uh, have a counseling with the pediatrician or the surgeon to facilitate neonatal management. Uh, but remember, obstetric sonography is also the best way to terrify a pregnant woman. Again, prenatal testing is a process and not just a lab procedure. We should know which test to do how to interpret, how to counsel. Again, the goal of prenatal diagnosis is not to generate perfect babies. So there are no perfect human specimens. They're certainly genetically flawed in some way. But what I would see is, let's not use ultrasound and apply it to cause harm to the babies or offer unnecessary terminations. I would end by saying, let's be primum non nocere. This is the physician's hypocrite oath that we take. And we say, I will apply treatment for the benefit of the sick according to my ability and judgment. I will keep them from harm and injustice. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am, for such a lucid presentation. I think uh, uh, it was a marathon, but uh, I'm sure that a lot of myths have been cleared. Uh, before we go further, uh, there are one, two important questions, ma'am. Uh, yes. You did mention in your presentation to divide the mothers into low, intermediate, and high risk based on the first trimester scan. Right. So can you, can you summarize that again? What should be done for low risk? What should be done intermediate and high risk? Yeah. Uh, see, if she's had a good NT scan and a biochemical, the risk comes in one in so-and-so. So if the risk is, say, one in 100 and less, we definitely have to offer them invasive testing and do a chorion villus sample and offer them microarray. If the risk is between 1 in 100 to 1 in 1000 and there are no other abnormalities on scan, then we can offer them NIPT. If the risk is above 1 in 1000, then she only goes for the target of 90. Is that clear? Sure, ma'am. Uh, like your first trimester screening, are there any calculations for second trimester too? Yes. Like risk assessment? Yeah, the second trimester also comes in uh, the ratios only. One in thousand, one in ten. I mean, same, same way. The results come the same way. Okay. Three to impossible. But oh. then, see, the disadvantage that we find with NIPT is it takes two weeks to come. Right, and the chances of recollection of blood are very high. Most often, the fetal fraction is less, so they say we want another sample. So, if I have done it in the second trimester and then I can't offer her an IPT because my liver, is right? So, we generally okay. tend to tell them invasive testing in the second trimester because the time to give the report is rather less. So, we so tend there are questions. There are some questions, ma'am. Right. Um, do you advise karyotyping in all fetuses with cystic hygroma? 
uh, yes and no. If it's really huge cystic mass and you know the outcome is that if we agree, it tells us it is 45 XO. But there are a lot and lot, apart from chromosomal, there could be a lot of other abnormalities. But the outcome is so bad that we give them that option. <coughs> they can go in for a termination or they can do a karyotype and then go in for a termination. What is the cause of increased nuclear translucency in Downs? Any particular reason why these anomalies have this? Yes, there is a lot of explanation. First and foremost is there is a lymphatic. Uh, there is a defect in the lympho lymphatic system development. Second is they may also have cardiac abnormalities like AVSD, which itself increases or there may be diaphragma. So there is this collection is an early sign of probably the lymphatic uh, lymphopoiesis is affected. And that is why these babies have increased NT and which resolves as even if the baby has downs, that marker doesn't remain. That means they have a delayed development of the lymphatic system mostly. Or it could be the cardiac abnormality which is associated. So once a TIFA scan is done, ma'am, you would hardly have any time for a genetic testing. So how do we go about? Because if you will send for CVS or that time, or sorry, amniocentesis or cell-free DNA, it will take time. So how do we approach them? 21 weeks, we did a TIFA and we find something abnormal. So what do we do then? See, we do the test. And till 24 now, the limits of termination, and we offer them fish. Fish is a good enough test which again can pick up the five abnormalities of the program. 13, 18, 20. So I have a typical abnormality like a double bubble or an AVSD. Then I will ask for that particular chromosome by doing a fluorescence in situ hybridization. And that will give me a good enough information within 72 hours. She's just about 21, 22 weeks. Yeah. That's doing a scan at the appropriate time is probably the only answer to our, uh, if they come late, we have no option but to just counsel them and move them forward. So do we routinely do MCA, PCV in all babies in the third trimester to pick up the fetal anemia? Not all. The indications is RH isoimmunization. All cases of ventriclomegaly, definitely. We do all cases of eye drops. We definitely do. And all women who come with diminished fetal movements, we do it because we picked up some cases of fetal metal hemorrhage by doing MCA PSV in mothers who have complained of diminished fetal movements. And then we have What is the minimum? Minimum? What, sorry. What are the minimum, uh, ultrasound uh, things to be looked at in a baby with high drops? Right. Uh, if you see a baby with high drops, first maternal. I would go from the maternal factors, whether she has diabetes, whether she has any other problems, especially SLE, which could be again complete heart lock or any of those things. So the maternal history is very important. Then uh, I would go to the fetus, a complete structural survey, heart rhythm is important. I will do an MCA Doppler, especially echo is very important. We will look at the placenta, the light, and then offer the images. So minimum all the planes, especially heart in detail, heart rate in detail, heart. because the PR interval, everything. I would look at the rhythm. It could be tachycardia, it could be bradycardia. So any abnormality, any diaphragmatic hernia, any structural abnormality can cause high drops. So maternal factors, fetal, placental, abnormalities, and then offer her invasive. So do isolated ARCA, ecogenic bubble, and triple marker merit additional testing? Triple marker, which triple marker? Just triple marker, being positive. Triple marker is no more, it's an obsolete test. Yes. Quadruple today. But ARSA, yes. Increased isolated ARSA, does it require additional? If she's had a good first trimester screening, we're not offering them addition. See, if her risk is already one in thousand, it's increasing it threefold. Still, it is one in three fifty, yes. one in four hundred. So I will not offer her if her risk has been fairly low by doing a first to second trimester. Yeah. 
but I have an unoccupied nasal bowl. I have an echogenic small bowl, then definitely I go low. Not ARSA. What is the role of self? Uh, is there any chance of twin to twin in DCD atoms? No, not that. No, the whole thing is of a monoclonic pregnancy. Not really. Bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney. We do we advise continuation of pregnancy? Uh, how's the lyca? How's the growth? The what is the gestational age? The answer would depend on these three. Supposing she's already thirty-two weeks. So there is one. Right. I think so. Yeah, isolated no, but we have to look for like our volume and other things. Uh, Ma'am, there is one unrelated, but your take on umbilical cord blanks, cord banking. Actually, umbilical cord blood banking. The company themselves, we had met life cell people. They themselves have stopped it. Uh, they are no more yeah. collecting it today. There is no condition which is definitely treatable by that. In India, with the climatic conditions, we do not, we have, none of us have seen the labs. So this is how we counsel our parents. We, we don't know where they're keeping it. We had one couple with thalassemia, which they wanted it. They could not retrieve the sample though for the second child they had given. Their, the way they collect the blood, the way they're storing it, where they are storing it, how will they retrieve it, everything is a big uh, uh, question mark on us. So we as such are not advising yeah. our parents. Now life cell itself has stopped its activities. There are many other commercial that, but no. It really today has no role. I would still hesitate to ask any couple to go and give blood. No. What is your take on this, Srinivas? No, ma'am. Any? It is like blood bank. Uh, uh, you want to donate, you do it. But don't expect it to uh, to come for your baby. Uh, we don't know in future it may be useful for some cell to be given for some baby. It may come to useful. But for your own baby, don't expect it to come back to you. So it's like donation. If you want to donate, keep to it. Uh, if isolated ecogenic bowel, postnatally baby looks, appears normal, do we still uh, monitor the baby for something? Cystic fibrosis, I have seen two or three cases. Mothers, uh... One was the gynecologist herself. So okay. this is something uh, absolutely no family history that baby had cystic fibrosis. Yeah. So we would uh, at least do a carrier thing for the parents. At least one of them you can offer her carrier status. And then if she's not a carrier, then we say, no, the baby is fine. But yes, that is one can, uh, marker which has so uh, what we generally do is we ask the parents to this came off the So the baby sample is then not processed for cystic fibrosis. So the common mutation, we ask them to get it done during pregnancy and uh, offer them torch invasive testing and evolving fetal, uh, structural abnormalities of the bowel. That's how we're doing our uh, assist, uh, I mean, uh, echogenic bowel follow-up. Finger auto amputation, is it possible to see in the tri third trimester? No. I think they're asking about uh, uh, amniotic band syndromes. Uh, no. You can not really. In the third trimester, if any abnormality is in the limb, because the baby do too much. Uh, the limbs are the difficult. So, talipus, amputations, very, very, I would say it's very difficult. Unless the baby really shows there's enough like a, uh, it's very difficult. So that's all, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> so thank you so much. I think uh, it was a uh, very good uh, lecture. And then a lot of people are feeling that it was an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, uh, there are a lot of comments which you can see that uh, they really enjoyed the time they spent today uh, evening. Thank you so, for the opportunity. And thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We move on to the next part of the presentation that is uh, poll for today.
uh, we have uh, the poll for yesterday's lecture and uh, that is on open lung concept and the uh, and the lessons learned so i am launching the poll please uh, all the audience please take the poll so i'll share my screen can can you people see the poll yes sure yes okay yeah thank you Rishi, are you ready with your tip of the day? Rishi? Yes. Yeah. So more than 75% of the people have already answered. So I'll close the poll in another five seconds. Those who want to finish off, please do it. Actually, we can share the results of all the polls with the audience if they are interested, but uh, maybe we need to see how we get only your answers. Okay, uh, the answers for the poll are uh, as follows. So can you see the results? Rishi, can you yes. see the results? Yes, yes. Okay, so open lung concept involve all except avoiding high peep is a wrong answer. And in fact, open lung context means giving high peep. In open lung concept, which is a correct option, the correct option is we keep on increasing the peep till there is a fall in SpO2. All the other options are wrong. Open lung con uh, ventilation. PEEP is increased. Keeping delta P is the right answer. All the others are wrong. Um, and they, 
pip is not concept concept but uh, the delta p is constant and not pip pp is increased till upper inflection point wrong it is only till the lower inflection point pp is increased in recurrent extubation failure which of the following is not an important reason laryngomalacia does not cause extubation failures others do in the current management of rds in elb dental lisa and cpap are the preferred methods ventilation and intubation still occurs in 85% of babies in elbws and surfactant is not a rarity more than 50% still require surfactant so rishi over to you okay. so we just have uh, three more uh, lectures pending so uh, tomorrow is the lecture from dr jiva and day after we have a panel and a lecture on genetics and the day after that uh, uh, yeah we will end day after shrini is it visible yeah okay so the tip of the day for today is that uh, we know the preferred route for drug delivery in uh, the delivery room is through the umbilical ves umbilical uh, uh, vessels and the key point which happens in the commotion which happens when the drug delivery takes place is to identify the umbilical artery or the vein textbooks talk about artery and vein based on their position caliber size of the lumen the number of the vessels the color of the blood and the pulsatility of the flow but the simplest and the easiest way to identify the umbilical vein in the delivery room is when you take a cut cut, cut section of the cord you will find that the artery is constrict and the vein the vein will have a speck of blood what is called as the bindi so if you find when you look at the cut, cut cut section of the cord there is a small speck of blood that is the vein and that's the most reliable way by which we can pick an umbilical vein because that is where we have to introduce the catheter now having identified the umbilical vein and we introduce the catheter how are we sure that we are in the vein only and nothing else again we think of color of the blood the pulsatile flow the ease of insertion and maybe the imaging technique but the tip of the day for identifying that the catheter is in the umbilical vein in the delivery room is that you should be able to palpate it in the supra umbilical space it will roll between your fingers and you know you are definitely in the vein so these are small tips which will ensure that you enter the vein and you are sure that you are 100% in the vein and nowhere else to administer the medications back to you shrini thank you uh, rishi and uh, thank you everyone for attending for today's uh, important lecture and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, dr geeta and it was a real pleasure to have you uh, for this day thank you so much ma'am thank, thank you ma'am thank you good night